We we'll lastly hear from the OIM president who inherited a question from the last time he was up the podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to, before I begin, take this time to recognize the elected uh, officers of the Organization of Liberians in Minnesota here present. I'm Mr. Andrew Temme, our Vice President. I have Mr. Kula Parker seated next to him, our Treasurer. We have uh, Thalia Cooper, our General Secretary. Earlier, you had the opportunity to interact with uh, two of our board members. Uh, Doris Parker and Georgette Gray. I don't see them here anymore, but we want to recognize them as well. I will be speaking about our experience as a diaspora community as it relates to the period of this conflict. I will give you a little hint just about the migration patterns of Liberians to Minnesota talk about some of the activities we are engaged in that we believe uh, will be helpful to this process of uh, national reconciliation, talk about uh, what's happened in our community as far as reconciliation goes, and forward some recommendations. In the 1970s, there were about 25 Liberians in the state. We were not that many. Most came uh, to attend Dunwoody uh, Institute. Dunwoody is a technical college in uh, the Minneapolis uptown area that uh, was providing uh, training in mining technology. And Minnesota has or used to have a serious uh, mining industry. as an iron range of north, so Lamco and uh, used to send a lot of the students here on scholarship. Then we had the period of migration from 1980 to 1990, which uh, primarily consisted of people both. Before 1980, most people coming to this country were coming directly to go to school, get that American degree, and go back home. 1980 came, the coup came, and Liberia became inhabitable for a lot of people. And and many of them found their way to Minnesota. And it became sort of a temporary but permanent home, hoping that conditions in Liberia would change. We had the same situation in 1990. We have the post-1990 migration, uh, which is characterized by the same situation, except now uh, the conditions in Liberia were so terrible. Uh, people came fleeing the war. Some had already given up on Liberia because of the trauma that they faced. And some hoped that and one, you know, one day they will be able to return to Liberia. These groups uh, represent different uh, challenges, different opportunities, uh, different demographics. It's been a challenge for our community. We've grown to between 25,000 and 30,000 people. Uh, the group that came prior to the 1980 knew exactly what they were coming for, were focused, uh, tended to have the education. The group that came after 1980, between 1980 and 1990, was sort of a mix, but a lot were very educated, very focused, and knew what they wanted, had the means to li leave Liberia, had the motivation to leave, and had a plan to uh, sustain themselves in America. The post-1990 migration pattern pre presents us with a slightly different set of circumstances as a result of the demographics. Uh, you heard earlier from the women's panel that uh, besides having people who were educated, had lived here, uh, could you know, sustain themselves in this society, we had young children, boys and girls, who perhaps were in the second grade in, 1980, in 1990, uh, had been out of school for five years and arrived here in 1997 and was expected to be in the seventh grade. Uh, we had 
families that relocated simply because this is, you know, there was a refugee program, but the issues of cultural assimilation was quite more difficult for those families. And it's been a challenge for our community, it's been a challenge of providing the needed resources to help these families to assimilate. Uh, the question of law and order as it relates to the cultural context uh, is another concern. I think it was Harriet Badia who was, you know, spoke on the issue of uh, domestic violence. And there's a story about, you know, a young man who came from Liberia. Uh, he had an argument with his girlfriend, so he got mad. He stopped the car on the side of the highway and began to beat her. And the police stopped him and went to intervene. He told him, I beat him, I'm going to to put your hands up. <laughs> he was promptly arrested, of course, and he learned a lesson in American culture and the legal system. We also have a lot of very, very promising stories. Uh, we have a number of youth who have come, taken advantage of the opportunity, and gotten very solid education for their future. They are taking advantage of the environment. We have a lot of people who have used the opportunity for being here to advance themselves and acquire skills that uh, is helping their own personal development. And they hope to one day go back to Liberia and transfer these skills. Uh, our community has been very instrumental in helping uh, the economy in Liberia in many ways, the remittances that we sent. Uh, at the times, especially at the darkest hours, uh, people are on the phones trying to get money to Western Union. When Western Union broke down, we have a, a local businessman here, Velma Port, who has his own money transfer business, and Velma Port has been able to make it possible for Liberians to send money uh, to their families, even when all the technology has broken down. Uh, we are starting a number of businesses in Liberia. When you go to Liberia today, and I've seen it for myself, others continue to confirm that, most of the foreign license plates you will see on cars in Liberia are Minnesota license plates. Uh, we're building homes. Uh, some people intend to use those homes for retirement homes. Some people are building those homes, you know, so that when they go back next year, two years, five years down the road, they will have a place to stay. Some are building hotels, motels. And we're participating in the economic revival and the social uh, revival of Liberia. Our community has also, as I said earlier in my personal uh, testimony, this community has been in the forefront also of uh, advocacy for the rights of Liberians, both at home and here. Uh, elements of our community have also been on the other side uh, of the instigation and also resolving the war. We have issues here that deal with immigration. Uh, prior to the war, we had uh, people who were on visitor's visas, student visas, couldn't work. Because of the war, we have the TPS situation, temporary protective status, which allowed people to be able to work since they couldn't return to Liberia. Now that the war is over, now that Liberia is recovering, the legal basis for granting temporary protective status is no longer there. But we have a situation where some people have been on TPS now for 18 years. Uh, we have families that came from Liberia with two children. They had two children here, and they're on TPS. The American-born children can stay, but the Liberian-born children have to leave. So it's a major challenge for our community, and this is why we've made a, he a high priority to lobby for passage of the Liberian Immigration uh, Fairness Act. Uh, we are pleased to say that we have uh, excellent support from our congressional delegations in the state. We are working along with EULA to make sure that uh, the coalition that we built uh, has a national uh, appeal to it that uh, organizations and you know, legislators in other states can uh, join us and support us, and it will be important that the government of Liberia uh, is helpful in that 
effort because we don't believe that Liberia is ready and capable of absorbing uh, the Liberians here that are affected by this status. If they have to go home, what you will have is that you will be taking people who are uh, economically independent today, they are working, they're participating in uh, sustaining their friends and relatives in Liberia, and you will be taking them and putting them in a mix of 85 percent unemployment. They will no longer be able to care for those people who were in Liberia that, are, that were being helped. So you even compound the problem further. We believe that that is a risk to Liberia's recovery, both uh, economic and security. Uh, on the level of, of what's happening in this community with regards to reconciliation, you know, in Liberia, I was there for the elections. Uh, the people of Grand Jita and the people of Nima County in Liberia voted on opposite sides. But here in Minnesota, I can tell you, going back as far as the George Wool uh, administration, this election, the people of Grand Jita and the people of Nima voted on the same side. In my own election, I enjoyed an overwhelming support from the people of Grand Jita, as well as the Mandingo community in this uh, state. We also witnessed in 2004, Arthur Watson, who's from Grand Jita, and George Ward run on the same ticket uh, for the ULA presidency and the vice presidency, respectively. We have in Nima County now, the United Nima uh, organization, UNICO. We have a president elected three weeks ago, uh, Mohammed Keita. Uh, so we believe that uh, we are taking concrete steps, uh, reconciling ourselves in this community with regards particularly to the ethnic groups that were at loggerheads during this conflict. Uh, we have a lot of work left to do but we think that there's an opportunity that we can help with reconciliation in Liberia to ensure that people are no longer at loggerheads, but we judge people by the content of their character rather than their ethnicity. Uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, that's something we've been able to accomplish here. I do believe that economics uh, plays a role in the capacity to reconcile at this level uh, because people are no longer hungry, they're no longer desperate, so they can pay attention to higher order issues. And uh, so we all think we have a solemn responsibility to be a part of the economic revival of Liberia because ultimately the conflict reduce, is reduced to the lowest common denomination is the fight for bread. Some people wanted more than dry bread. Others wanted filet mignon, and they were prepared to kill their friends and their compatriots to maintain that power. It, it comes down to issues of livelihood. So the issue of reviving Liberia's economy is very, very critical to this whole con this whole issue of reconciliation. Uh, we're also involved in trying to structure a trade mission to go to Liberia with investors from the state of Minnesota uh, to provide information. Last year, uh, we hosted an investment symposium here that brought the uh, National Investment Commission the Minister of Lands and Mines, uh, the energy sector, and, and the agriculture sector to try to promote Liberia as a destination for investment. And that's something that we take very serious as a part of this economic revival. Uh, we're also working with uh, institutions that can help us in the relief area as it relates to two particular areas, uh, the health, revitalizing the health care and revitalizing the educational sector. So these are uh, activities that our community is uh, embarking upon to help in 
rebuilding our country. We want to advance some recommendations on behalf of this community that we believe will go a long way in bringing about uh, peace, reconciliation, stability, and a prosperous future. Uh, when I say peace, I mean it in the sense that conflict is not just the absence of war. Conflict is the absence of people tearing apart each other because of their competing interests. And if we, when we accommodate each other's competing interests, then we reduce conflict. This is why in my personal testimony, I made it a point to go to the pre-1979, because even though we were not shooting at each other, there was a lot of conflict in the society. So we need to be able to structure our society and manage it in a way that we can uh, reduce conflict, uh, keep it to a minimum so that it doesn't threaten the society. It's going to sound very similar to my uh, personal recommendations, but I'll repeat this on behalf of the community. Uh, we believe that there should be accountability uh, there should be a level of accountability for what's happened. The database of information that this commission will collect to serve as the guiding tool for determining how you, we assign that accountability. But at the very least, we should see some prosecutions out of this process. We spoke we believe that the concentration of power in Liberia has been a prescription for conflict. It has created a situation where the president has been almighty and absolute power corrupts. Because of the absolute power that our presidents have enjoyed, they've been able to exact sycophancy sicko, out of citizens who have been prepared to tell any lies that they can tell on their fellow citizens to gain the favor of the president. So we need to decentralize that power by ensuring, first of all, that we have a strong legislature, a strong judiciary, and that counties are able to elect their leaders. They can have their own uh, county legislature. We can create a revenue sharing formula where the county determines their own budgets, how they're going to prioritize uh, those resources. And that's going to be a proving ground for leadership. We can see how John Brown operates as the leader of Grand Jeter County. And based on the development it brings to Grand Jeter County, we can say this is a person capable of assuming national leadership. We can see how somebody does it in Maryland County. We can see how Maryland County legislator, a Sino County legislator, stands up to the county executive for what is right. And the people of Sino can say, you, you need to go represent us on a national level. Economic power has to be decentralized in a number of ways. Not only that the local governmental units would have control over dedicated resources by an agreed upon formula rather than by the whims of somebody uh, who can change their mind when they fall out of favor. We also need to look at empowering Liberian businesses. It's, I, I go back to, there was a statement that was made to me by a Lebanese merchant who was my neighbor in uh, the early 90s in Monrovia. He said, oh, the Toba government was sweet. I could just sign my business card. I said, give this man $10,000, and they get that loan. Well, he didn't realize he was speaking to somebody whose father had 10 times more collateral but couldn't get the loan for what he needed. And we need to stop that. Our governments need to stop being afraid of Liberian people getting rich. Adam Smith. And Carl Adams 
believe in one fundamental principle. One was the founder of, of Karl Marx, I'm sorry, one was the founder of capitalism, one was the founder of communism. He said the basic purpose of a government is to enhance the welfare of its citizens. And Liberia cannot continue to fail on that benchmark. The government must take enhancing a citizen's welfare as its number one priority. Economic welfare, security welfare, psychological welfare, social welfare. And that can only come about through economic empowerment and decentralization. We need to be serious about reparations to those who've been hurt by this crisis. We need to ensure that those who have been hurt the most, not in terms of the dollar amount that they lost or the number of relatives that they lost, but the impact on their lives. Some people lost millions of dollars and have recovered. Some people lost $500 in the only house they've had and they've never recovered. That person who's never recovered should be a priority. We need to memorialize the victims of this conflict. We need to make sure that we never forget this. We also need to make sure that our military and paramilitary forces have the proper training and indoctrination to protect and serve the people, not the president. In 1990, we saw the armed forces of Liberia paid for by your tax dollar, my tax dollar, saying no do, no Liberia. That should never happen again. They were not there for do, they were there for the Liberian people. Because they feel that sacred responsibility, we are where we are today. And then we want to make sure that our citizens who've had to flee Liberia because of the instability of the past 29 years, who've taken residence in other countries, who've established roots, but still have the deep love for Liberia, be allowed to hold dual citizenship. I thank you very much for your work. On behalf of the Liberian community in Minnesota, I want to say that it's been an honor, it's been a privilege to have you in our midst for this historic occasion, representing the first time a TRC has held hearings, public hearings in the diaspora. We walk away from this deeply touched, more inspired, more motivated to ensure that our country reconciles and rebuilds and that we never ever repeat the mistakes of our past. We also want to say do not be disheartened that this room was not filled in any of your exercises. Many of us here work two and three jobs to support our friends and family back home. Those of us who have not been able to be here at times when I haven't been here, I've turned on the internet and I've followed the proceedings. So this uh, process, these proceedings have been observed by more people than what you've seen here. Uh, it's a talk of the town and people are grateful that you are here. Uh, we know that this is an important step in our rise from the ashes. We encourage you to go forth with more resolve and your conscience, let your conscience be your guide. Thank you very much.